glad that we have many guests here in the audience to share this with us. I'm certainly excited to hear from Mr. Pinsky, who has a rather timely talk, I think, planned for us tonight. I'm also thankful that one of LA's own literary voices, poet Lynn Thompson, will moderate our discussion later on. Let me add a thank you to our Master of Arts in the Humanities program for their support in tonight's event and reception. The Mount is still a women's university, especially at our traditional undergraduate level. level. But here at the Doheny campus, we also have a wide range of adult undergraduate and graduate courses available to both men and women. It's great to see our faculty and students from many of these programs here tonight in the audience. I'd now like to introduce you to Gabriel Meyer, Executive Director of the Ruskin Art Club, and an award-winning poet and journalist himself. Gabriel, thank you for your leadership in putting this event tonight together, and welcome to the Mount. The Ruskin Art Club, this is our 129th year as a cultural association in Los Angeles. Uh, you'll find pamphlets, by the way, in the uh, foyer uh, on the history of the Ruskin Art Club. With a history this long, we've had connections with quite a number of historic Los Angeles institutions, uh, and among them Mount St. Mary's University, uh, as Bob was telling you, particularly through Estelle Doheny, uh, who with other leaders of LA's cultural and social elite was a member of the club in the 1920s. Uh, by the way, in various discussions about uh, Estelle Doheny's membership of the Ruskin Art Club, I came upon the club's roster for 19 in the list of members was Estelle Dovini, uh, H. Chester Place. We're actually now exploring uh, for how many years Estelle may have been a member of the club. Actually, it may have been quite considerable. Um, in any case, we are proud to have renewed our association with Mount St. Mary's University in the past several years, and we look forward to our future relationship. When Robert Pinsky first indicated that he was basing his talk on Ruskin's uh, 1858 essay, The Work of Iron, and you'll see a, a, a key quote from uh, that essay projected on the screen, I had to admit that I, that I didn't know it. Uh, with when, with uh, a, an author whose who's collected works of 39 volumes, it's easy to miss something uh, in, in that range. Uh, but I remembered uh, after we, we agreed on the, on the, on the talk, um, going and looking at it, remembering that I had glanced at it many years before when I saw that the topic was iron oxidation, felt that I could probably skip it uh, and move on. Uh, but going back over it, um, you know, it, it was amazing. It's, it's really a masterpiece. And in, in preparing for tonight's lecture, I discovered in thinking about it, what a, um, uh, a jazz-like uh, rhythm Ruskin sets up in that essay. In fact, it, that may be a, uh, a, a good description of Ruskin's essential style. He'll start off with something like iron oxidation and then go on to uh, iron in art and go on to the purpose of fences and then begin asking the reader all kinds of impertinent questions about, about uh, how, how you put up your fences and why you're putting them up and who you're trying to prevent uh, from, uh, from having contact with you, and then going on to uh, social philosophy of our uh, attitude towards the working poor. So uh, a bit like a jazz musician, Ruskin riffs on these, takes the theme in all sorts of uh, wonderful and unexpected uh, directions. Anyone interested, uh, by the way, can read the whole lecture uh, through a link on our uh, website RuskinArtClub.com. Without further ado, let me bring on Elena Karina Byrne, who is the Ruskin Art Club's Literary Programs Director. Uh, she's also herself uh, the author of three uh, books of, of, of poetry and uh, um, also a book of essays. And uh, uh, she is a, a one of the, the real lights of our scene here in Southern California with, I think, increasing appreciation around the country. So I'd like to introduce Elena, have her come and introduce our speaker. Thank you. This is not my first time introducing a former poet laureate of the United States, Mr. Robert Pinsky. Um, I'm fortunate to say I've had the opportunity at least two other times before in the 1990s, 
the Chef de Marmont Hotel, and also several times um, at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. Um, when I was regional director of the Poetry Society of America, and I'm still a, um, a moderator and consultant at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. And of course, our paths have crossed many times since. One of the most memorable at Heather McHugh's fundraiser for caregivers when Robert and his poetry shared the stage with jazz musicians, um, something he does incredibly well and often. Multi-award winning poet, essayist, translator, literary critic, author of 19 books, Robert Pinsky's elegant poetry is often praised for its vivid imagination and wild music. And I would say he is a poet who creates perpetual quality of variety and surprise. In his essay of King's Treasuries, John Ruskin points out what we may find in Latin and Greek's indistinct translations of the word spirit, the words breath and wind appear, also the sense of the words writing and inspiration. At a time, let's say, without stating the, the political obvious right now, when suddenly it seems apparent so much is in peril and at risk because maybe of a lack of intelligence and heart, it is important to say that Robert Pinsky's powerful inspirational breath of work carries that true narrative velocity toward the heart's inner. <coughs> I am certain that John Ruskin would have loved Pinsky's translation of Dante's Inferno, and in speaking of Milton and Dante in that same essay, Ruskin said, you must enter their thoughts and hearts for, quote, clear sight, share their passion. He goes on to say, and I quote, the ennobling difference between one man and another is precisely this, that one feels more than another. We are only human insofar as we are sensitive, and our honor is precisely in proportion to our passion. Now, deploying our exaltation and departure toward any transformative impact language may have on us today, we can anticipate a wonderful lecture. <clears throat> now, just to borrow a few choice lines from our stunning guest, and here are his lines. Here with dirty thunder, tentative laughter, lordly music, please welcome the passion of Robert Pinsky. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Elena and Gabriel and John. Um, my plan tonight is to inexpertly and without scholarly knowledge suggest a few ideas in the work, uh, principles in the work of John Ruskin, and then try to apply them to the work of some modernist poets I love very much, the work of uh, William Carlos Williams quintessential modernists. I was delighted when uh, Elena and Gabriel said they would like it if I read some of my own work as well, not only through the normal egotism of the author, but also because it did suggest a certain informality, that this will not be an academic lecture in which I unpack knowledge from my head and try to put it into your heads. I also presume to say a little bit about the state of California, where I have lived on and off for years, and some of my family lives. And I'd like to put the state of California and the history of art and the attachment to art in California, manifested by you, my hosts, the Ruskin Art Club, and in much of the architecture and culture of California. Culture, I am convinced, is determinative. It will look as though politics, military strength, economic strength, determines the course of culture. In the course of my life, I've become convinced that the opposite is the case. That culture forms the course of history. When you say culture, and we're talking about what people think they should eat, what funeral customs they should have. Um, to take an example that's familiar to Americans, the 
rich scientist tell us is totally numerical. It's not, it has no reality whatsoever. If people die, people have conflict, all sorts of emotions come as a result of that cultural, the academic call, the construct. So I'll try to present a few ideas, loose about them, and relate them to poetry. The image that stayed with me in the life of John Ruskin is the image of a very small child whose parents were uh, evangelists. That's something somewhat different in 19th century England than it means uh, in this country, I believe. Amongst their beliefs was that toys were not good for the child. They were well-off people, but the child did not have little balls and games and figures and contraptions. And the image that stays with me is that the, uh, the caretaker of the child on a good day would put him out in the garden. But he didn't have a little rake, he didn't have a little toy horse, he didn't have anything he could ride on wheels. And he looked. He looked at the sunlight on the bricks of the wall of the garden. And in the course of an hour or two that he might be in the garden, the angle of the sun changed. The nature of the clouds might change. And on the tiny little differences in the appearance of the brick wall in the sun, the habit of mind of the author of the Stones of Things was formed. The habit of mind in which tracing immensely small distinctions, particularly visual ones, leads to great truth, or certainly fills a great tremendous appetite, a cultural and personal appetite is filled by that close scrutiny of what for many of us would be almost nothing at all. The talk that Gabriel referred to jazz like in the improvisatory. The talk was given in the city of Tunbridge Wells. I learned from the talk that one of the things about Tunbridge Wells is that the water there has a lot of iron in it. So that um, if you see a public fountain or somebody's sink that's been used a long time, it is stained And John Ruskin constructed an entire talk. Since he was going to Tunbridge Wells, he riffed on the idea that in Tunbridge Wells, the water has got a lot of water, a lot of iron in it. So he says to the Tunbridge Wells audience, I'll read a little bit, he includes this passage behind me. Before he gets to iron and labor, iron and culture, he does iron in nature. You all probably know the ochreous stain, which perhaps is often thought to spoil the basin of your spring. This iron in a state of rust. And when you see rusty iron in other places, you generally think not only that it spoils the place it stains, but that it is spoiled itself. That rusty iron is spoiled iron. For most of our uses, generally is so. And because we can't use a rusty knife or a rusty razor as well as a polished one, we suppose it to be a great defect in iron that it is subject to rust. But not at all. On the contrary, the most perfect and useful state of it is that ochreous stain. And therefore, it's endowed with so ready a disposition to get itself into that state. It's not a fault in the iron, but a virtue to be so fond of getting rusty. For in that condition, 
In that condition, it fulfills its most important functions in the universe and its most kindly duties to mankind. Nay, in a certain sense, and almost a literal one, we may say that iron rusted is living, but when pure or polished, dead. You probably know that in the mixed air we breathe, the part of it is essentially needful to us is called oxygen. And that this substance is to all animals in the most accurate sense of the word, breath of life. And it goes into iron as a part of the process of our bodies, in our blood. You can perhaps trace a little bit, maybe I can smell or hear a little bit of an overtone of his parents. Christianity in his trying to say what is the uh, spiritual nature of iron's desire to rust. And in the essay, he goes on to talk about all the beautiful colors in nature and how all of them are dependent upon that process of oxidation. I'll muse on that a little bit more, but now I'm going to uh, jump to what I think is possibly uh, a, more, a more familiar part of the Ruskin canon. Uh, this is probably too late for me to ask this question, but I wonder if we could have a show of hands. How many people here can say that they, they've read a, 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 a lot of Ruskin, they've read a lot of Ruskin? So about 15 or 20 percent of us. I hope that reassures the other uh, 80 or 85 percent. That's why I took that poll. Um, the more familiar, the more familiar essay that I'm talking about is the Goth book. And like the remarks about Tunbridge Wells on his part, I'm going to try to relate what he says about the Gothic to a cultural aesthetic that I think is American and modernist and may even be related to an aesthetic that is Californian. And I'm going to quote a California poet to you later on with the idea that California, though he doesn't call it that, but the California aesthetic in relation to a more classical European or East Coast aesthetic. I'm thinking of green and green houses, for example, or craftsman houses. It is more Gothic than Romanesque or classical or Palladian. And uh, California ideas about cuisine and other things perhaps are as well, as I think American
These characters are here expressed as belonging to the builder. As belonging to the builder, they would be expressed thus. One, savageness or rudeness. Two, love of change. Three, love of nature. Four, disturbed imagination. That is, not linear or pacific imagination, uh, but disturbed imagination as well as savageness or rudeness, rather than finishedness or intense civilization. Love of nature. Disturbed or turned imagination. Five, obstinacy. Six, generosity. And uh, I'll try now to demonstrate to you why I feel um, a patriotic twinge in relation to the American poets whose work I love, and uh, at least a speculation about ornament and California. I assume most people here have been in the Bohemian Mansion. Apparently it's used in many, many films. And uh, in my mind, it too represents a gothic, obstinate, savage, disturbed, generous nature, rather than uh, a cool, symmetrical, finished, polished nature. I'm going to read one of my favorite poems to you. I did for the Library of America, I did the Selected Poems of William Carlos Williams. And I had a comical argument with the Library of America at one point. I do want to put in, I'll try not to use it, I've seen the expression, I really do want to put in that darn wheelbarrow. <laughs> I had enough of the bloody wheelbarrow. He said, oh, you can. <laughs> so many teachers use it. And uh, I had a friend who once asked her, uh, her freshman class, that was a brilliant assignment. She was introducing the poetry, and she said, I would like you to pick out a poem that you really hate and give me a reason with evidence and examples, a reasonable explanation of why you hate that man. <laughs> very, very good assignment. And to her amazement, out of 17 or 18 kids, something like seven or eight of them chose so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow. <laughs> why? Because they had to read it in high school. And in most cases, the well-meaning teacher saying or implying, this doesn't look like much to you, but I'm smart and I know it's really, really good. I gave in. I let them bully me into uh, putting the wheelbarrow in. And that's the last I'm going to say about the wheelbarrow. This is a poem I love by William Carlos Williams. And I'm inviting you to join me in thinking about whether it has the generosity the obstinacy, the rudeness, the characteristics of the Gothic. The poem is called Fine Work with Pitch and Cover. Williams was a medical doctor, and uh, I've read that he kept the typewriter in his office in his examining room, and sometimes between patients he'd write a poem. Quickly. And this one, I picture him looking out the window and seeing guys doing roofing, roofers working. Roofing amongst the trades is considered the most gothic. It's the most brutal. It's dangerous. It's hard to do. And uh, by comparison, plumbing requires a sensitive person. You know, at the top of the scale, the least gothic is the finished carpenter. Fine work with pitch and cover. Now they're resting in a fleckless light, separately in unison, like the sacks of sifted stones stacked regularly by twos about the flat roof, ready after lunch for the old wooden spoon. The copper from eight foot strips has been beaten lengthwise down the center at right angles and lies ready to edge the coping. One still chewing, 
picks up a copper spoon and runs his eye along it. I love the sounds of this poem. They're not like the sounds of um, Keats's Ode to a Nightingale, for example, or sounds of Booker. It's not like my heart aches in a drowsy numbness, pains my sense, as though I'm not by a drunk, or I think it's some dark cube who dreams one that sinks in leaky woods at some. It's not like Yeats saying, um, that is no country for young men, young mourners are as birds in the trees. Those, the birds, those dying generations of the song, the mackerel fast falls, the salmon crabby springs, caught in that sensual music, all neglect of oneness, of lineage and makeup. Now, this poem is in the, it starts off in the key of A. And then it modulates into boom. Now they are resting in the fleckless light separately. Do you hear? Now they are resting in the fleckless light separately and in unison. Like the six sifted stone stack, regularly like tools about the flat roof, ready after lunch to be opened and spooned. That's the first of the three sentences. The middle sentence could appear in an article by How to Do Roofing. The copper of eight foot strips has been beaten lengthwise at right angles and lies ready to edge the coping. The copper, and it's so beautiful as a sentence. The copper of eight foot strips has been beaten lengthwise at right angles and lies ready to edge the coping. If rhyme is like sounds, the poem is written in rhyme. If rhyme is we sat together at one summer's end, that beautiful wild woman, your good friend. Then it's not that. It is obstinate, savage, rude. And after he says, the copper and eight foot strips has been beaten lengthwise down the center at right angles and lies ready to edge the coke pit. Then comes the last sentence. One still chewing picks up a copper strip and runs his eye along it. As he has just run his eye along the guy's doing the roof thing. But one picks up a copper strip and runs his eye along it. The narrative itself is observant, like the child looking at the sun on the brick. It's observant, and it loves the nature of things. He was so good at observing what is actually happening. I don't know that before Williams anybody noticed and had the ability to put in the poem that luxury we give ourselves. By ourselves, I mean people who think and also work with their hands, where you're doing a job and you're going to have your lunch break or a snack break, and you give yourself the luxury of making the transition gradual. One still chewing picks up the copper strip. Runs his eye along it. One still chewing. It's like in that poem where he says he passes the young housewife in his car, and I bow as I pass. The Jew people do bow at the wheel of a car. The Gothic imagination, the American modernist imagination, has the ability and the obstinacy and the rudeness, in a way, to notice that bow at the wheel of a car. To notice that one still chewing picks up a copper strip and runs his eye along it. And even picks up a copper strip. The, set, the, the copper and eight foot strips has been beaten lengthwise at right angles and lies ready to edge the coat pit. One still chewing picks up a copper strip and runs his eye along it. It's like he's obstinately saying, This is my music, not the music of Keats or of Yeats or due respect. I discovered in preparing to talk to you that there actually is a Williams poem that I put in this book in which he uses the word gothic in the title. I'll warn you, it's not nearly as good a poem, in my opinion, as the Feinberg or Pitching Copper. It's a bit of a cliche. All those cliches, they, they, you know, what was Jesus really like? 
for people who were never satisfied with her. Because she's just the only white person in the Middle East. In fact, but the poem does have something, and it suits, it suits my purpose that it does use. The poem is called Gothic Candor. Gothic Candor. You have such a way of talking to him in capitalized age. You have such a way of talking to him. It's kind of rude, kind of obstinate, whatever. You have such a way of talking to him and his little 15-year-old mother. <laughs> his little 15-year-old mother. She was never a tragic figure, he said. I feel sorry for them. They were pathetic. I pitied them. And I wonder if those sculptors ever really looked at a woman holding a baby in her arms. Oh, see this one. I'm so glad he made him a Jew. And look at her face. That's the way he was when he was here with us. Just a little Jewish baby. I don't think it is as uh, wonderful a poem as the other poem. But it has that insistent, obstinate freshness. And I like freshness as it because it includes fresh in the colloquial sense. You're fresh if you're not behaving in this manner of ways we would like. So he's being fresh about the baby Jesus, but even more fresh about traditional religious stature. I wonder if those sculptors ever actually looked at a woman holding a baby. Oh, look, he's just a little Jewish baby. <laughs> Here is a poem by the rough contemporary Williams, Mary Ann Roth. And the observation of one particular image is of interest to me in relation to that idea that the rusted, the thing in process, is superior to the thing that is polished. It's more of Silence. My father used to say, superior people never make long visits, have to be shown Longfellow's grave, nor the glass flowers at Harvard. Self-reliant like a cat that takes its prey to privacy, the mouse's limp tail hanging like a shoelace from its mouth. They sometimes enjoy solitude and can be robbed of speech by speech which has delighted them. The deepest feeling always shows itself in silence, not in silence, but restraint. Nor was he insincere in saying, make my house your inn. Inns are not residences. The mode of writing or the mode of you say, blah, 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 not blah, 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 blah. The deepest feeling always shows itself in silence, not in silence, but restraint. That self-revision of not what I just said, but something else, and not polishing it until you have it, well then say what you mean. That's in the spirit that I'm talking about. And here, it's enjoying flaunting it. And something like the same rhythm as in the Williams poems there, they sometimes enjoy solitude and can be robbed of speech by speech which has delighted them. The recurrence of that word speech can be robbed of speech by speech which has delighted them. So there's that, um, you could call it rusty or rude. It is the element it is the element to me um, that is characteristic of American art. And uh, you can think about whether it has to do with uh, California and why 130 years ago, people in California, those women, decided that Ruskin, who was their guide, Ruskin, of course, the guide of William Morris, who was uh, such an important figure for green and green. 
I discovered that Liam's poem from Getting Ready to Talk to You. And I discovered this um, poem. I must have read it before. But I had to be focused on this poem of Moore's. So I'll also give you a poem of Moore's that surprised me. She has a poem to military progress. And this poem thoroughly anthropomorphizes or makes a person as military progress. And um, it has differently from the Williams I talked about, the at separate, resting separate in the fleshless light. Mm -hmm. This has a different way, in way, almost a parody of conventional rhyme, in the way it sounds and moves. To military progress. You use your mind like a millstone to grind chaff. You use your mind like a millstone to grind chaff. Grinding chaff is such a peculiar part. Chaff is what you separate out from the onion. And the rhyme is so peculiar. You use your mind like a millstone to grind chaff. You polish it, and with your warped wit, laugh. Chaff, laugh. You use your mind like a millstone to grind chaff. You polish it, and with your warped wit, laugh. Torso, prostrate with a crow falls, one such faint hearts as its garden parts, calls and claps its wings till the tumult brings more black men, men to revive again. So is the, the image of the crows gathering around carrion is related to military progress and what it grinds. Till the tumult brings more black men, men to revive again. War at little cost. They cry for the lost head and seek their prize till the evening skies red. And a kind of barbaric or jagged quality of the rhymes is like a critique of war imagery progress, but maybe even more just a critique of the eloquence the reader expects. And to me, the Ruskinian degree of attention and focusing on the rust stains in the basin or the fountain or the sunlight in the wall, uh, I guess the American, the more American term for the quality would be cussedness. Not rhyming or proceeding in a way that would seem most appropriate uh, or most condign. Well, I promised you I would read um, a California poet, and I'm very aware that in many ways in talking about California, I'm talking from my hat. I don't know much about California. Uh, I was born in the Superior State of New Jersey <laughs> and uh, grew up there. But I do know Californians, and I know some Californians poetry, and that is one of many examples. Um, James McMichael wrote a book length poem called Four Good Things. And in it, he talks about the history of Caltech. He'll describe the wind tunnel of Bon Carmen. But he goes to the origins of Caltech in describing the Pasadena building. Bungalows were less in fashion at this period he's writing about than the Spanishy flat shuttered fronts, wrought iron bars and spears, and balconies with canvas awnings, doors with the ornate churigoresques that public buildings had, and movie houses, filling stations, churches, and stores. This was their colonial revival. It was old in what it missed, that native aristocracy of landed dons. Its counterpart, years before, that was their colonial revival. And the East Coast colonial revival had a different form. Its counterpart, 10 years before, had been the Green and Greens, who, whose oil and soap rich clients wanted liberal freestanding houses that this claimed the sources of their wealth. They disclaimed the 
the sources of the new wealth the greens like william morris wanted well made things for everyone and wanted everyone to make them and morris got that completely from ruskin that you should not have anything in your house that brutalized the person who made it you don't have factory made glass beads you have something the worker could take pride in making the greens like morris wanted well made things for everyone and wanted everyone to make them if they could caltech was still thwarting polytechnic how many people in the world have recognized the name through polytechnic some probably 10 or 12 percent caltech was still through polytechnic it taught both it taught both sexes carpentry and churning architectural design the students learned to sew and weave and work with leather clay and metals george ellery hale would change that from the queen's own patrons he had won endowments for his telescope and for the funds it took to bring more science to the school he could foresee pure research and technology as complementary twin halves the region was cut off it needed fuel and water power geologists and engineers were paid for one another's futures for the futures too of climatology and astrophysics the future was successive and successful answers to those questions it made sense to ask how far from the earth itself could we project and what was light in the calculus of variations what was the mean process of behavior in a species, in a social class? Could we compute a place for each of us within the equalizing sameness of plan? And plan, and in that transition, what he makes in that passage from the bungalows to the colonial revival of Spanish period, talking about Wiki's paradigm. He knew what they'd do if he were thorough. Anything would do within its randomness what he could plan that it would do. It helped if one knew how to simulate a world the way von Karman did. His tunnel, the wind tunnel, was a closed system. It had its own supply of air and kept returning it in one uninterrupted flow across the surfaces of streamlined winds and cowlings. In that thin layer of air around him, he had found imaginary drains and faucets that would change the flow and shock their plane to spasms. He found the vortex street, the drag on slender bodies like the trout that Sir George Cayley watched in 1840 in a pool below some shallows. Sand and fuller's earth had shifted along the bottom, subtly, with its nose against the current in its hole. The trout was a spindle with diminishing resistance toward the tail. Von Karman often climbed inside his tunnel. He'd lie out flat. He'd feel the way the flow would touch him if he, as if he were the trout. Quote, a well-fed fish of 13 ounces and the length that Cayley had divided into thirds and measured for the mean diameters. Von Karman knew that these diameters were basic. They were the girths at common points along the profile of a new design. The bell X1 confirmed exa conformed exactly, and the flying wing. Rockets were something else again. He leased an office from a former vita juice dispenser, Henry Gibble. He took in Zwicky as his partner. He called the corporation Aerojet and worked on tracking, staging, and the two propellants that had blasted through a Caltech wall. So you have there two components of American culture, planning and technology on the one hand, and the emphasis on the craftsman's intelligence on the other hand. Two elements of what we have around us in California, the intense planning and uh, predicting of Silicon Valley and computers, and on the other hand, the Crescent House, the green and green house. And in the history of Caltech, you have these two elements. I don't put 
begin to understand it any more than they understand um, the, the canon of, of Ruskin's work. But in the modernist impulse not to conform to something symmetrical and polished, you have the seeds of these two things. And you have the idea of the dignity of the worker, and the worker doing something that the worker relishes. And you have this other idea that he takes up. And Ruskin, not always an attractive figure, when he talks about uh, iron in relation to, he doesn't like the idea of liberty too much at all. Uh, he talks about the worker, and the worker uh, should not want to control the worker, should be happiness of being told what to do. And then like a Gothic, uh, craftsman, then you make your gargoyle, or your carving, and you're a part of the structure. These seem to me difficult issues to define, define and the most important issues for confronting. How, in the complicated technological matrix, do you allow for whatever you embark the value in particular human beings? I'll close by um, obeying and reading some of my own work. And first I'll read a poem I'll read a poem to you that uh, has always been in this book in the past. Uh, I'll, I'll read a poem to you <laughs> that ends with the idea of uh, the consumer of goods and the maker of goods experiencing, I use the verb satisfying. They are both satisfied. And um, the question could be raised, are there different kinds of satisfaction? I don't know. Anyway, I'll read this poem, which I wrote probably 15 or 20 years ago, and then maybe I'll close with a couple of recent poems and then it will be Lynn Thompson's problem. <laughs> what to do next? I went through a period in my writing when I thought I should be able to write about anything at all. And uh, in, in that spirit of the child who has nothing else to play with, it just looks. Whatever I saw next, whatever I touched next, I would write a poem about it. Not with the idea that everything is poetry all, but with the idea that everything is a doorway that you might be able to go through to find everything else. Shirt. The back. The yoke. The yardage. Lack seams. The nearly invisible stitches along the collar turned in the sweatshop and by Koreans or Malaysians gossiping over tea and noodles on their break, or talking money or politics, while one fitted this arm piece with its overseam to the band of cuff I button at my wrist. The presser, the cutter, the finger, the mangle, the meeting, the union. The treadmill, the bobbin, the code, the infamous blaze at the Triangle Factory in 1911. 146 died in the flames on the ninth floor. No hydrants, no fire escapes. The witness in the building across the street who watched how a young man helped the girl to step up to the windowsill, then held her out away from the masonry wall and let her drop and then another, as if he were helping them up to enter a streetcar and not eternity. A third before he dropped her, put her arms around his neck and kissed him. Then he held her into space and dropped her. Almost at once, he stepped to the sill himself. His jacket flared and fluttered up from his shirt as he came down, air filling the legs of his gray trousers. Like heart brains bedlam, shrill shirt ballooning. Wonderful how the pattern matches perfectly across the placket and over the twin bar tacked corners of both pockets, like a strict rhyme or a major chord. 
prints, plans, checks, hound's tooth, patrasol, mattress, the clan Tarkins invented by mill owners inspired by the hoax of Ashen to control their savage Scottish workers, tamed by a fabricated heraldry, McGregor, Bailey, McMartin, the kilt devised for workers to wear among the dusty, clattering looms, weavers, carvers, spinners, the broker, the docker, the navvy, the planter, the baker, the sorter sweating at her machine in a river of cotton as slaves in calico head rags sweated in fields. George Herbert, your descendant is a black lady in South Carolina. Her name is Irma and she inspected my shirt. Its color and fit and feel and its clean smell have satisfied both her and me. We have culled its cost and quality down to the buttons of simulated bone, the buttonholes, the sizing, the facing, the characters printed in black on neckband and tail, the shape, the label, the vapor, the color the shade, the shirt. The poem uh, comes, among other things, by uh, the uh, book by the uh, left-wing left -wing British historian, Hotspawn. It's called The Invention of Tradition. And Hotspawn says the idea that the, the Scots had a different partner for each clan, totally advertising, 19th century propaganda. So if you go into a snob clothing store and say, oh, I'm a cannibal, I would like those jockey shirts. That's what it just had to do with marketing. And he says in the invention of tradition, the things that people say are ancient, like all the objects and vestments and vestitures when they have a new monarch in England, all 19th century inventions. Our ancestors used to do this and that. Not true. I don't know. I can't argue with him for him. But it was an interesting idea to me. I devoted my life to, to ancestor worship. You know, poetry, this thing, I was going by what these people did in the past and how they do justice to it. Um, so it was an interesting idea to me. I like the idea that you can have a rude, savage, obstinate, uh, distorting approach to the past that might be more true than something that says this is orderly and it's passed down from the past and this is what it is. Um, and Hobsbawm, in a sense, is concerned about those workers. The Roman Scots consider the Highland Scots animals, the one called Green. So according to him, after the Battle of Culloden, when they killed infants, they killed pregnant women. Then they want to tame these animals and teach them how to work in the mills. And they were accustomed to wearing these big long bathrooms. Look shameful into the mill. And sometimes they, they would get caught in the machinery. Dead body parts in the machinery. You could lose hours getting them out of there. So they made manuscripts for them. And eventually, since we always send them out as people who oppress, the regiment of the Prince of Wales wears those manuscripts. That's the story. Um, think about reading one poem from my new book to you, and uh, then I'll be happy to entertain uh, questions and gentle remarks. <laughs> and uh, for me, the spirit I'm talking about Always frustrated. You know, William Morris, whose ideas you know you so manifest in the beginning of Caltech, Morris was a Marxist. William Morris wanted to give workers things to make that they would improve their own. He became basically an interior decorator for rich people. His fabrics and his papers and his designs. And uh, so the history of Caltech that ambiguity, that is there in all of this history. And uh, 
it manifests itself in me uh, in my love for heterogeneity. I mistrust purity. I'm very suspicious of things that are pure, I like things that are mixed. And for me, it's the genius of uh, American culture at its best is that it is always, it's always an ongoing project. Do we have great economic power? Do we have great military power? Are we a great people? We're working on it. The, divide, the racial divide is only the most egregious version of the fact we're not one by blood. We're not one by religion. We're still working on it. We're making it up. It's an imaginative process. And uh, it depends upon your attention to people's actual nature. Chewing or doing a transition run your eye along it. And I don't say that the Irma whom I imagine inspecting my shirt, I don't say she's gratified. Look that I am. I don't say we're satiated. More belligerently, I say it satisfied her in me. And this is uh, a poem in praise of uh, mixing Dr. Weinberg did get elected mayor, 
Job worked for him for years. At the bank, John Smock, an Episcopalian whose family once owned the bank, had played sports with Milford, and he gave him a small loan with no collateral, so he opened his own shop, grinding lenses and selling glasses. As his mother-in-law said, almost a professional. Optician comes from a Greek word that has to do with seeing. Banker comes from an Italian word for a bench, where people sat to make loans or change. Pinsky, like Tex or Brooklyn, is a name nobody would have if they were still in that same place. Those names all signify someone who's been away from home for a while. Schiavone or Chavon means a slav or slave. Milford is a variant on the poet's names. Milton, Herbert, Sydney, that certain immigrants used to give to their offspring. And Creole, Creole comes from a word meaning to breed or to create in a place. Thank you. up there is polished is dead because I'm happy I don't have to be polished. That's, that's a really good thing. I think what we'd like to do though is um, take some questions from the audience, um, hopefully from Mr. Pinsky, and start there. Don't all raise your hands at once. Yes, yeah, Suzanne. Uh, I wanted to thank you, first of all, thank you for that stunning Here's my, but now you can hear me. I have to start all over. Thank you for that, uh, that, that fascinating and, and stunning uh, presentation and for reading the shirt and, and your other uh, more recent poem. And I, I was struck by the great range of knowledge. Uh, I think you used the word uh, heterogeneity. I mispronounced that. Can you say it right? She, she said it right. And, uh, and, and before you said it, I'd already been thinking about how vast your knowledge is and how you draw from so many different sources, from history, from politics, from nomenclature, um, architecture. And can you speak to that a little bit more? Do you, um, and you have books that, have, uh, that you've read in other fields outside of poetry that had an enduring influence on you, and if so, can you mention them? Is that what you're talking about? Books and poetry, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to give a straightforward, thank you very much for the time that you said. I'll try to be very straightforward about the idea that I have a lot of knowledge without uh, clowning about it. I have never had a scholarly mind. I've never known a lot about anything. Uh, a moving target is what I did. So I have always had this uh, gathering. Uh, I like to pick up little shiny bits of information and knowledge and play with them. So um, sometimes it gives the impression of erudition. And I'm trying to do this without being sort of that. The erudition is partly an illusion. It's just I'm interested in a lot of things. If I talk to a guy who, uh, uh, restores the septic tank when it's been used in. I like to find out what he knows. I like to ask him about where it comes from. I like to know about the machinery and the chemicals involved in the septic tank. If I talk to somebody who is uh, a real estate attorney, I like finding out what he has to need to deal with. And a book like that, Hobsbawm book, I'm sure I didn't read every word of it. I read the essay about Killed probably every word in it. So it's a certain kind of mind. And uh, 
this term Gothic probably applies to that kind of mind too. I don't build the wonderful symmetrical temple of what I know about some period in time or about some art, but uh, I'd like to say I'm going to spend some time doing this gargoyle right here. And uh, in doing that gargoyle, I pick up things from the guy who actually was the architect of that part of the cathedral. Uh, books of poetry that have influenced me. Um, amongst my favorite poets are Gwendolyn Brooks, Philip Gray, uh, Pablo Neruda, um, Constantine Cavafy, Robert Hayden, um, John Keats, etc. I like things that sound good in poetry. Uh, interesting ideas are good, and I don't mind it. Unless there's a pleasure in saying it, it doesn't stay with me. For me, there's a tremendous appetite for that moment between the body and the mind. You're about to say something, you say to the person next to you, do you know what Pinsky's talking about? Before you say, do you know what? You're, you're thinking, and then it goes into this. It becomes physical, it becomes bodily. I think our appetite, that process of speech, is so basic to this evolution of this primate, this animal, that we have a tremendous need for it. And, uh, I don't think poetry and music are at the fringe of human intelligence. I think they're right in the center of it, right at the middle. Basic, fundamental, the root and the center. And uh, so when you ask me for the list of things, I start going through my head on love, on grief, on every human thing. Time sprinkles leaves of water with his wing. On love, on grief. And then three times at the beginning, I put my upper teeth in my lower lip. On love, on grief, on every human thing. Time sprinkles leaves. Three times I put my lips water with his wing. And without noticing that, we're very moved by it. And uh, it's, a, it's partly music and it's partly thinking. And that's very, very powerful for us. I think I've demonstrated it. Yes, of course, you know how I would react. Yeah. So they have. <laughs> I just wanted to, um, and it, it, now I'm going to kick myself because I, it's been a while since I read this, but um, I think it was Dorothy Barisi was talking about Mary Moore's interest. Can you, can you talk a little bit? Moore's about mother, Harriet Moore's mother, was a vegetarian of John Wesley. And as we know from that biography a couple of years ago, the mother was a very, very powerful figure in her life. She lived through until she died. Um, and Moore's cultivated and calculated eccentricity, which could be parodied. I think was very consciously related to the idea of the Gothic. And uh, her love of quotation as well as love of nature. And she's always talking about animals and she's always talking about them in a way that it's it's not the not to not to it's not the animal being itself, it's the animal also being The only thing that will cure a sick lion is if it eats an apple. Like that. We have tried very hard 
we were extremely cruel to one another in this country in ways that are particularly American. I mean, our harvest was a slave. It wasn't the kind of slave we have here. Harvest's father was a slave in the Roman Republic. To hold us together, we have professional sports. I think much more powerful than professional sports or certain college regions, college sports, much more powerful are music, which almost entirely is based on the blues. Basically, again, mixing its African rhythms and somewhat scales with European marching band instruments. And that's behind American show tunes and Gertrude's, behind jazz, it's behind hip hop. That's one of our fabrications. American film. These semi educated, poorly educated uh, Jewish immigrants invented this legalistic code where. You have a gunfight, whoever shoots first by a fraction of a second is in this completely nothing to do. You read actual accounts of Lee Twain or Harvard or anybody who actually was around the actual cowboys. They would fire many, many, many bullets at one another, hitting occasionally. Sometimes there was the guy they were shooting at. But we make these, these works. And um, what the hell? Maybe I think we, could, we should make this evening go too long. You know, uh, people labor here. Uh, why don't I just, uh, why don't I read a recent poem? We had the Writers Resist uh, in New York on uh, January 15th. And God, I didn't want to. Uh, I had just arrived in California, and then they said, we're doing Writers Resist in New York, and uh, finally, I had to get back in an airplane. And they asked me, you know, the poet warrior thing is they asked me to write a poem for the occasion. And this poem, maybe I'll close with this. It, it tries to speak uh, to the question about uh, culture holding us together or apart. And, uh, I'm an ancestor worshiper in a certain sense. I'm certainly more sure of the wisdom of the old ones than I am of any theological thing. And as I get the American idea, my ancestors are not literal. You know, I hope Frederick Douglass is my ancestor. So is the slave owner, Thomas Jefferson. I hope. Uh, I hope that Bill Cather is my ancestor and not Mark Twain and Ella Fitzgerald. And uh, they're the only ones who can save us, is our ancestors. And uh, if we're not going to be at one another's throats in a totally destructive way, and if we're not going to accede to lies, just let ourselves be totally bullshitted into a dictatorship, they've endured worse. They seem worse, and there are models. So I wrote this poem for that occasion. It's called Exile and Lightning. Exile and Lightning. You choose your ancestors. We our ancestor, Ralph Ellison. Now, fellow descendants, we endure a moment of charismatic indecency sanctimonious greed, falsehood beyond shame. Our Polish grandfather, Czesław Miłosz, and our African-American grandmother, Gwendolyn Brooks, endured worse than this. Fight first, then fiddle, she wrote. Our great-grandmother, Emma Lazarus, wrote that the flame of the man or the mother of exiles is, quote, imprisoned lightning, end quote. My fellow children of exile and lightning, the indecency constructs its own statuary. But our uncle, our uncle Ernesto Cardinal says, sabemos que el pueblo la derribará in día. The people will tear it down. Migo 
Bloch says, beautiful and very young, meaning recent, are poetry and philosophia, meaning science, her ally in the service of the good. Their enemies, he wrote, have delivered themselves to destruction. Udia and very young, that long ancestral view of time. Fellow inheritors in a pueblo, fellow exiles, all the quicker our need to fight and make music, as Gwendolyn Brooks wrote, to civilize a space.